here this morning. Amen. Yes. Amen. My wife, Corey, is with me, and we haven't had a long association with your church, but our church has. I'm from uh, Grace Bible Fellowship in Wallingford, and over the last, how many years? Our pastors have been meeting first with Pastor Cliff here, and then with Justin Hunter. Uh, some of our men have come and uh, helped do repairs in the building. In fact, this beautiful altar that you see here, which covers the baptistry, uh, came from the wooden pews that were here, built by uh, a young man in our church who used to be a uh, Latin teacher. Uh, you don't think of Latin teachers as uh, craftsmen. Uh, today he has uh, moved into the insurance business. But uh, we've been sending teams. Uh, summer after summer, we had a team here this summer. It was my first visit to Hope, Philadelphia. Uh, they gave me a good job. I was down in the basement of the uh, parsonage, breaking out the old uh, cast iron pipes. They said, Bob, it's a good job for you. It was demolition all the way. And then we started putting in the new PVC pipe. Anybody worked around PVC pipe and those solvents, that'll make you high real quick. You know? <laughs> Every once in a while saying, hey guys, we need to get out of this, this, this basement. But we had a wonderful time here. And, and I was so impressed with the beauty of your facility, of this church, both this level down below, and the way you care for it. I was also impressed with the parsonage, and I thought, boy, that'd be a nice place to live. I don't know what my mindset was before I came here, even about the community. It's a beautiful community. It's a wonderful place to live. And um, I've been asked to become what we call in the Bible Fellowship Church a surrogate elder. So Dr. Dave Allen and I are going to come alongside these two gentlemen and you, and hopefully over the next months, See what God's going to do here to rejuvenate, to, 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 to um, bring new life to Hope Philadelphia, bring hope to this, this community. I hope you are praying every day for this ministry. I'm not so sure all of you are, but maybe starting today, <laughs> you, you will. Since I'll be in and out, I want to share just a little bit who I am. It's good to know the people that are providing some leadership. My wife and I began ministry as missionaries in the land of Brazil way back in 1968 after graduating from Washington Bible College, Capital Bible Seminary in Washington, D.C. And then after term of ministry there, I returned to the United States. I was on staff at that school in Washington. 30 years ago, we joined an organization called BCM International. It was traditionally known as the Bible Club Movement. In fact, Next year, we will celebrate 80 years, and it was founded right here in the city of Philadelphia, a ministry to kids. A lady by the name of um, Bessie Traber had been a missionary in the Philippines, and she came back to the United States due to poor health. She said to a group of children, she was telling them about the Bible clubs that she was teaching in, 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 in the Philippines, uh, and, and one little boy raised his hand and said, Miss Traber, why can't we have a Bible club like that here? And God used that thought to plant a ministry, ministering to children, ministering to teenagers. Back in the 70s, we were in countries where there were few of any churches, and we started planting churches, so that the ministry has now grown to over 850 staff, ministering in 53 countries. Over these last few years, uh, around the world, in five continents, our missionary family had planted over 6,000 churches, including one in the United States and a few in Canada, but most of them in Asia, Latin America, Europe, and in, in Africa. I was European director for a number of years. I was president of the organization. And then about 10 years ago, I said to our BCM board of directors, I, I want to get back out in the front lines. I, I want to get out of the office. I want to get out of the fundraising business. I, I want to be where the action is. So I have the great privilege today of serving as international representative, ministering to a missionary family, encouraging, helping them, help them develop, develop effective strategies, but doing a lot of training, training of national church leaders, training of developing missionaries in national countries. And 
and uh, this is what we do. People say to me, Bob, how much do you travel? Well, I'm away from home anywhere between 120 and 130 days every year. How many miles do you log? I have no idea. How many miles have I traveled? I do know that I have been in at least 180 different airports around the world. And, uh, but my dear wife puts up with this, and when it's possible, like here, she joins me, sometimes overseas as, as, as well. But we are glad to be here today. We are glad that you are here today. I trust the Holy Spirit of God will take his word, use it in each one of our hearts. Do you pray with me? Father, thank you for this special day, the day of the resurrection. But in this year, we look at it as the Sunday before the celebration of the gift of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Open our hearts, our minds, may your Holy Spirit take these feeble lips and minister to each one of us, I pray in Jesus' name. I think all of us realize that a major part of Christmas is giving and receiving. I was a bit surprised when I heard the other day that Cole's department store is now open 24 hours leading up to Christmas Eve. Have you seen the advertisement on the TV about Acura, I think it is, and he gets a new Audi and because he gets a new Audi, he goes out and buys a new Audi for his wife. Now, I don't know about you, but there are not going to be two new Audis sitting in our driveway. Coming out. <laughs> I don't know how much a new Audi costs, but how much does a new Audi cost? Uh, more than I can afford it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no matter how much we talk about commercialism, we all participate. Who does not like to receive a gift? Who doesn't like to give a gift? We even make lists of gifts that we would like to receive and gifts of what we would like to buy. Corey, uh, that's my wife's name, uh, emailed our 12-year-old grandson back a few weeks ago. Ryan lives in Crofton, Maryland with his mom and dad and, and, and brother and sister. And she emailed me and she said, Ryan, what would you like for Christmas? It was the quickest return email you could imagine. And it started out with iPhone 6. Now he's 12 years old. And then he had two or three other items there and, and, and so forth. But what was cute is at the bottom he said, but Grandma, the more important question is, what would you like for Christmas? And she read this and said, honey, look at it. In fact, she forwarded it to me. Look at what I got from Ryan. Well, we were visiting with them last weekend, and, and, and so Corey was praising Ryan in front of his mother and his seven, six-year-old sister. Well, his six-year-old sister said, Grandma, Ryan really wants an iPhone. And she said it in such a way, you knew that what she was saying is, Ryan was smoozing you. She would, because he thought you would buy him. The, so I thought, here's a six-year-old who knew, you know, what was, what was going on. We search for just the right gift. We hope for that special item. Perhaps we have special remembrances of gifts we have received. You do, don't you? You remember when you were a child, you remember when you snuck down the steps or you went into the living room where the Christmas <clears throat> tree was and, and you looked in and maybe you even looked at the right gift for you. Last night when we get home, the court turned on the TV and there was a special on there from Billy Graham Association and some of the Graham family were sitting around talking about and Franklin Graham uh, talked about the time that he snuck down as a little boy and he went to the uh, fireplace where the stockings were hung and his sister stockings and brother stockings, they all had nice things. His was full of, he called them switches. 
which meant little sticks that his, maybe his parents used from time to time and so forth. And, and then at the bottom, I think he said, down on the floor were a pile of ashes. And he thought, oh my goodness, poor me, you know. And then he snuck up to bed. He didn't want anybody to know that he saw that. And then when the family got called and everybody came down, everybody was all excited, but Franklin wasn't very excited. And then his mom, with a twinkle in her eye, handed him a stocking like everybody else with the candy and the fruit and, you know, everything else. Now, here he is, a grown man. He remembers that in detail. When I was eight years old, my parents said, what would you like for Christmas? I said, I want a bicycle. I didn't want a blue one, a red one, or a green one. I wanted a black one. I didn't want one with coaster brakes. I wanted one with hand brakes. I didn't want a one speed or a 10 speed. I wanted a three speed. I didn't want a Schwinn. I didn't want a Huffy. I wanted a Raleigh bicycle. That was a good choice. Now, why did I want a Raleigh bicycle? Because during that last year, that year, I had lived in Ireland for five months. And all my cousins had Raleigh bicycles. In my mind, the best kind of bicycle you could have was a Raleigh bicycle. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we have one of the most famous, most familiar, perhaps the most memorized verse in all the world. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only or his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I want us to look this morning at what God gave us on that first Christmas over 2,019 years ago. I want to do it in the form of an acrostic. G, I, V, E. Can you say that with me? G, I, V, E. G stands for grace. Grace. Go with me, if you have your Bibles, please, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. <coughs> Gospel of John, chapter 1. And if you have the same Bible as I do, it's on page 1090. But if you have some other Bible, I can't help you. John chapter 1, I want to begin reading at verse 14. And read through verse 17. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word here is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. That full expression of God. That's what the concept of the word actually means. So we can read it, and the full expression of God became flesh, took on flesh and blood. He dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, the one and only from the Father. Now notice, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he exists before me, for his fullness... <laughs> For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace, grace that will never end, grace that multiplies. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does the word grace mean? Grace means unmerited favor. Grace means 
receiving something that, that we did not deserve. And God in his love, out of his compassion, out of his com concern for mankind, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take on himself, my sin, your sin, the sin of the whole world. Grace is the personification of God manifested to us. Many, many years ago, I was flipping through my late mother-in-law's Bible, and she had an acrostic there for grace, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. You want a definition of grace? There it is. God's riches at Christ's expense. God gave his son who became poor that we might inherit his wealth. Uh, let me read one verse for you that helps solidify this. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Listen to this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. That's an amazing statement. He's not talking about financial wealth, financial security. He's not talking about two Audis in the driveway. He's talking about the gift of life for all eternity, purchased through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God's gift that you and I do not deserve. Well, that's G. G is what? Grace. Let's look at I. I is Emmanuel. We go back to the passage of scripture that Sean read for us in Matthew chapter 1. I want to begin just in verse 21. And she will bear a son, referring to Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sin. Now all this took place that was that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Now I realize that some translations use the E. Emmanuel can be spelled either I or E. Now what Matthew is doing here is quoting an exact quote of what the prophet Isaiah said way back 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. It's found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And, and, and what Matthew is saying is that which God pro prophesied through Isaiah the prophet is now accomplished. Behold, the virgin the woman who had never had any affair, any physical union with a man. She will be with child. She'll bear a son. You will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God gave his son, Jesus Christ, to identify and dwell with mankind. He was the sinless lamb, but he was made in such a way that he knows our weaknesses, he knows our problems, he knows our temptations. Every situation you and I encounter in life, and every day is full, Struggles, 
and joys, temptations and victory, physical hurts, spiritual hurt, emotional trauma. Every day can be filled with those things. But we have one from heaven who can identify with those things. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 9. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from the one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Well, what's the writer of Hebrews saying? The writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus Christ identifies with us as a human brother would identify with his siblings. Oftentimes when a problem comes into a family, the sibling whose suffering goes to the sibling, another sibling even before they come to the parents. Because they found help, they find counsel, they, 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 they find an understanding ear, they would say. Look, look over verse 16. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. And I think here he's talking about those who are spiritual descendants of Abraham, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he had to be made like his brother in all things, that he might become a merciful, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. The word propitiation means to satisfy what is demanded for the sins of mankind. Verse 18, for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Let me ask you, is there a person in this room who this week has never felt temptation to do that which is sinful or wrong? No. Where does our aid to overcome temptation come from? If we, we, we quoted the Lord's Prayer today. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the Lord Jesus is, is there standing beside us and by the Holy Spirit indwelling us, enabling us through His power to overcome temptation. Go over with me to chapter 4 of Hebrews, please. Since then, verse 14, Hebrews 4, 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of when temptation comes, when problems come, when difficulties are, are just in abundance, where should we run first? To Jesus. It says, draw near, find mercy, find grace, find victory over the struggle. I, I can't tell you how many times over the years people have said to me, nobody 
understands my needs, my situation, my struggles, my problems. People oftentimes run to another person looking for a solution to help them solve their problems. I'm not sure that people have the capacity in every situation to render a good solution. But Jesus can. You remember that old spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. I think of the people over the years that I've had very, very direct contact with. Times of miscarriage. Babies born greatly deformed. A father dying of cancer. A family with a wayward and rebellious daughter. Marital turmoil. Financial collapse. And they've come and said, Mr. <laughs> <clears throat> Many times I said, Lord, I don't know. When we have nobody else that we maybe feel comfortable to go to, we can cry out, God, help me. The one who has promised never to leave us, never to forsake us, never to abandon us.